right? So this is uh, uh, the second live stream of this class. And uh, today um, we will talk about um, the tutorials um, that were part of um, this first week. Um, before we do so though, I just have a couple of questions. And the first question is, um, is, are all students signed up to Canvas? Um, because I need Canvas to administer teams and uh, you know you need to ultimately like tell me with whom you collaborate, not this week, I think it's next week, but please make sure you're all signed up to Canvas. Um, if you are auditing this course, please put your name in the chat right now and say audit because um, I need to make a difference um, for the auditing students because you will not be given a grade and I need to put you in a little uh, a different group um, on Canvas. It also gives me a chance to connect uh, um, you guys to each other. Um, for example, if you're a PhD student or research master student, you may, uh, you know, want to work on different projects than um, our marketing and analytics students, maybe. Um, then I am still looking for a TA um, to help me with video editing. It takes me like, uh, like you know, an hour or two, um, like uh, for every session that I give to like uh, cut the video, crop it properly and put it online. So if you are, you know, have some affiliation with like video editing, you don't even need to be, you know, uh, you don't need to be an influencer with a thousand followers, but you know, if you have got some skills, let me know. Maybe also other tasks that I may need your support for. Um, uh, and then I added a link on Canvas uh, to the internal student uh, group. Um, it's managed by a student um, of yours. Um, and let me see, where is it? Um, there you go. So for each of those classes, well, this is data prep and workflow management, but we also got it for, for online data collection and management. There's a little WhatsApp link. I haven't joined this group, so, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're on your own here, but, you know, maybe you want to reach out to other students. Uh, this may be your way to connect. All right. So uh, today's topic uh, is going to be about the tutorials and, and the self-study. And um, actually, we'll start um, with a little um, activity. Um, uh, and that is, I want to mix you up, um, and I would just love um, you guys to exchange for a couple of minutes which sites or platforms or APIs or anything that is of interest to you, you know, um, uh, you know, about what you think would be like a cool resource to scrape or to collect data on, all right? So this is just a small activity, and your task is um, what side, if you, you know, if you, if you were a Python pro, what side or API would you get? And if you don't know about a website or API, what context do you find interesting? Okay, just exchange these ideas. And um, after you return back to this main room, we're just going to uh, quickly uh, put a few ideas on the board, right? But it's important that when we go through the pain of learning Python, we actually know what we are doing it for. And it is not to make you Python experts. It is because you want to collect awesome and amazing data to do some cool stuff with it. All right? So once again, I'll mix you in groups, I think like, you know, three, four students and um, just uh, quickly exchange a few ideas of what you would do. Rely on your gut feeling, all right? Sometimes that brings up the best ideas. So don't try to think about like what I wanna hear. Please don't do that, all right? So um, we'll uh, have a little breakout room and I'll see you back in five minutes, all right? Um, so here we go. How many? We are 40 students. So I'm just going to create um, 10 rooms. Well, maybe 12 rooms. All right, here we go. Um, I'm sharing a link right now, which you can do um, to add notes, um, but I'll start typing right away. So what I want to hear is just like spending uh, five minutes max on getting your ideas out here, right? So just give me your ideas on what you discussed. What are cool websites and APIs you'd love to scrape? Shoot out. You can put it in the doc and I'll comment on it, or you can unmute your mic and I'll type it for you, you know? Transfer markets. Oh, do you still actually want to talk to my neighbor who is working for this, you know, football club and data analytics? You know, I think I promised I could invite him, but I need to hang out more in the playgrounds, I guess, to meet his kid. Uh, Twitter API. All right. What else? Put it in the chat. Uh, Netflix. What do you want from Netflix, Sylvia? Netflix is like, you know, you can do a lot. You just want to, you know, you just want to like scrape a video and then run text analysis on it, on what's in there. Instagram. All right. Corona puppies. All right, that's interesting. Uh, to see Corona puppies, but on what? Not on Funda, right? Um, so um, I think Julie's type, who's typing anyways? Uh, yes, that's, cool. that's me, that's me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you wanna say something? Uh, yeah, well, like when you 
become more Corona Wappy, like with YouTube, etc. Because you watch videos, like the algorithm changes to like more videos of Corona. Very good, very good. Can you, uh, yeah, yeah, make it a little more uh, concrete, uh, so other people, you know, may eventually. <clears throat> so that's cool. Okay, that's all. Kaggle. What do you want from Kaggle? Who wrote down Kaggle? That was me. Um, I used Kaggle uh, for a course I did last semester. But it was not really scraping because I just picked a full data set of Kaggle. Exactly, and, uh, yeah, that's why. What do you want to scrape? Um, I'm not sure what I want to scrape yet. I, uh, I'm just looking for IDs, so. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool, all right. So uh, we got a couple of, uh, you know, uh, traditional uh, data sources used in marketing, but also a couple of, uh, of new stuff. Right, who thinks who has the most innovative uh, idea? You know, let's say new technology that's gonna come out in a few years or that's gonna become big in a few years. You know, um, chess website, that's interesting. Are you playing chess? Yeah. <laughs> so Brum, are you trying to spam people with email addresses? That is also web scraping, by the way. Um, all right, that's a cool first idea. Okay, why I think it's important to think about what you want as well. First of all, you have a group project. Eventually, you have to, you know, meet up and like, you know, get people on board with your idea. That's number one. But really, the other thing is, you need to know why you go through the pain of learning Python. And you know, if you're passionate about transfermark.com and you hate Python, you know, maybe your thoughts about soccer keep you alive during this session. All right, so. Uh, um, Thanks uh, a bunch. We'll keep this document alive. It's going to be a live document, and ultimately, this is going to evolve into your projects. But for now, I'll I'll close this and continue um, continue next. The next thing that I want to do with you guys is um, uh, to run a quick poll um, to know um, how far you got with Python to kind of judge um, uh, um, how far uh, you know how far you are already and kind of what level I need to pitch this, right? So on your screen, you're seeing a poll right now. Please fill in that poll real quick. Don't think too much about it. At least don't think more about, you know, filling it in than, you know, than I took time to actually create this poll. It's a very scientific poll. Great, 100% installed in Python, so that's cool. I'm just waiting for results to come in. Um, some people are experiencing errors um, in installing Python. So for this session, you can use um, the web version of, of uh, um, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, that's totally fine, but um, maybe in the break, um, that student can address me um, so we can work on solving the problems. 33% work through DataCamp, 40% are familiar with um, Jupyter, so that's uh, uh, probably because you use Jupyter in other classes. By the way, the chat is open. If you want to comment on what I'm saying, that's totally fine. Um, 10%, oh no, well, 25% are not familiar. It's okay. Da, 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 da. Um, all right. All right, and I am too fast. <laughs> All right, so I will slow down a little bit too. All right, thanks a bunch for these questions. Um, I will, um, I don't know whether these results of this poll actually are, are going to be saved. So I'm taking a screenshot right now um, so that I can, if I want, come back to it um, during, this, um, during this lecture. Sorry, I like sometimes keep forgetting about how. Okay, I'll just paste it here because I don't have a better place to paste it. Um, so thanks a bunch. So, um, so my lesson learned from this one is I will go slow and try to, you know, onboard, um, everybody, um, as uh, much as I, I can. All right, let's, um, let's continue. So probably what you discovered is when, when you, you know, think about like using Python that they're like million ways in which to use Python, right? So some of you, especially the Mac users, even if you haven't like installed anything with this class, if you're typing, you know, if you're opening your terminal and you're typing uh, Python, you know, Python is gonna pop up because it's kind of intertwined um, with your operating system, right? Um, so, other people 
um, use Python, and I'm not actually sure whether I have this actually installed like this, they um, use Python um, just by writing scripts. For example, they, they open an editor. Um, and for me, this editor is called Adam. Uh, it's, it's an editor I, I really like. And you open a script and you can write some programming code and then save that and then run this with Python. That's also a way to use Python. Well, in this class, we are using mainly at the beginning, Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is a, I would say, a teaching interface to Python. Um, why is that good? Because um, it doesn't look like a freaky editor, but it looks like you know a proper software program that you can even run in your browser. So it is way more accessible than um, let's say the uh, geeky looking uh, interface um, that I just showed you on the command prompt, right? Um, you may wonder why, why to learn Python, right? And here are a couple of arguments on why it is important to learn Python. First of all, it's multi-purpose. You learn it now for web scraping and APIs, but later on, you can use new stuff and do other things with it. You can prepare data sets with Python. You can uh, run a website in Python. You can write apps in Python. You can um, use sophisticated um, data science and machine learning algorithms with Python. Um, you're, you're really not limited by this language. So it's multi-purpose, number one. The second one is um, it's high level. It's relatively easy to learn. Uh, I have met high school students who learn Python in high school. Um, number three is it has an amazing documentation and an amazing community. So whenever you do, you know, I don't know, whatever you want to do in Python, like, I don't know. Um, um, okay, what, what can I ask? I mean, you can do anything in Python. So, I mean, whatever you want to Google, just write some funny stuff in the chat and I'll see whether you can do it in Python, all right? Um, probably there is an answer to how to do it in Python. Um, uh, for instance, um, okay, I'm, I'm so, like, okay, um, uh, uh, program a robot in Python, you know? And well, here you go, right? I mean, an introduction to robot programming. There's literally anything that goes with Python. Um, it's open source, so you don't need to pay for it, number one. Number two is when you move to a firm later on, when you get a real job, um, you can just use it without asking your boss because it's there. I mean, you just download it and you can use it. That's also why it's widely used in, in, in business and data science uh, firms and it's platform independent. So I can talk to Mac users and Windows users and Linux users and probably some other weird operating systems nobody knows or I don't know. Right, play the game Snake in Python. Oh, that's amazing. Um, play, no, actually program, program Snake in Python. Here we go. Uh, well, that is maybe the first thing. Okay, how to implement Snake game in Python. There you go. Okay, so I mean, literally, there is a gaming engine. It's called Pi Game. You create a view. You create the snake. You tell Python to move the snake, and probably there is like one thing that you can copy paste at the end. I want to see that game, all right? So whoever wants to submit me a Jupyter notebook in which I can play Snake, I would just like be so be backported to the 90s. That would be just amazing, all right? So yes, you can do anything in Python. Um, so, um, so far, um, that's kind of my, my, my introduction to Python about like why I am using it um, right now. Um, my plan is to go through the three tutorials. Um, well, first of all, maybe you have questions concerning this video and the differences with web scraping. I'll take questions on this. And then we'll go through each of the three steps of this tutorial. So right now, there is a little moment for you to think about questions um, relating to um, what you've heard so far. Bouter. What's uh, the U here? I don't get it. Maybe this was meant for somebody else, so that's totally fine too. All right. I judge there are no, um, no questions at this point. So let's go 
um, through the three steps of the tutorial. And see, you have to work through this tutorial yourself. So um, I think there was a large share of people who, I mean, you know, 70% didn't work through the data cam tutorial, right? But I'm not gonna work through the tutorial for you guys. This is not gonna work. You ultimately have to do it uh, uh, yourselves. So the way I do this now is um, that I explain you why each of the things that you do in this tutorial is important if you wanna learn web scraping. And I'll come up with an example for each of those things, right? But I will not cover each tiny bits of stuff. For those students that have already followed these tutorials, they may have questions. So even for the topics that I don't touch up on, like by myself, you can ask questions and I, I hope I can explain um, those. All right. Um, first of all, let's start up Jupyter Notebook and you know tag along with me if you like. So there are multiple ways in uh, which you can start up Jupyter Notebook. I think the um, most um, um, uh, most used way um, for, for students is to open Anaconda Navigator. So in your applications, so Windows users, they would press on Windows key and they just type like Anaconda and then Anaconda Navigator pops up. Uh, Mac users can just use, uh, you know, command space to get up this bar and then also type Anaconda. You can just click on it and actually, I never opened Python with Anaconda Navigator. So that's going to be exciting when it runs, but it should. So I'll move it to my screen in just a bit. So here we go, right? So this is probably what many people have seen. So this is Anaconda. Well, what is Anaconda? And why do we have to deal with snakes all the time, right? Python, but now we use Anaconda. And then I want to use Jupyter Notebook. So what is this all about? Well, you know. Python is the engine that runs everything, right? Uh, but then, like in a car, right? So you've got the engine and that's responsible to move the car ahead, right? But there are different ways to use a motor, right? You can put a motor in um, a scooter or you can put a motor in a car and then you can modify how the car looks, right? You can have like leather seats or you can have like, like cheap plastic seats. So while Python is the engine the programming engine that knows how to do everything. Anaconda, well, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook and all of these other editors that you see up here, they're just like ways to drive that motor. You know, one is very comfortable, but it can't go very fast. And the other one is like super fast, but it looks like extremely geeky, right? Um, and Jupyter Notebook somewhat seems like a car that you would like take a driver's license in, right? It's like not a Porsche, it's not a Mercedes. It's one that if it crashes, you know, your driving school will not lose a lot of money, but you know, it's damn good to learn driving. So that is somewhat um, uh, this about. And then what is Anaconda? Well, Anaconda, uh, I would say is like um, a perfect city, right? A perfect city where each hill that you're gonna, you know, go up in your car doesn't have any holes in the street, so you can go it up smoothly. It's a city where like all traffic lights are just like amazingly working well. Like, you know, they turn green when you approach the traffic light and, you know, it's just a city where there's always good weather. It's never too hot, it's never too cold. It's like perfect for driving. That is somewhat what Anaconda is. All right, let me go back from like, actually I don't have that in my notes, but I'm making it up on the spot. So what does that mean? Anaconda is an environment in which you can drive cars or program, right? It actually, in which you can program. It has a set of pre-installed packages. It's very easy to enter. It's very welcoming. Um, so when you install this perfect city Anaconda on your computing system, you just know that you can drive the car. It works. All right, and no matter whether uh, you are in, uh, you know, on a on on a Windows operating system or on a Linux operating system. So Anaconda packages all of this. I don't know whether this car, you know, comparison uh, uh, makes sense to you, but I hope it does just a little bit. Otherwise, whoever will help me editing these videos can take it out and come up with a better example. All right, so let's just launch Jupyter. I'm just clicking on it. And um, 
Well, something that you'll notice right away is there is no program that pops up. It's your browser. And then the Windows users in particular, they're going to get scared because suddenly Mac users may be not noticing this. They have this like thing on, you know, running and it shows like, I don't know, a server is running and well, it looks a little weird. So I need to explain you what, like how Jupyter works. Well, Jupyter was developed to run in the cloud. It's a, it's a, tool like on Google Colab that, that you can use in your browser. So when you run it on your own computer, it emulates a computer server. It emulates like some little piece of the internet and then opens that website of, an account, of Jupyter Notebook in your own browser. So that is why you have like this app running which looks weird and you may not know why it is. And when you, I mean, when you do stuff like the text changes here, like when you enter new directories or open, I don't know, open screenshots, well, that's not doing it. But like, I don't know if you, if you open a new notebook, uh, you know, you get like updated status messages. So this is like something you don't need to worry about so much, but the action with Jupyter runs in your browser. It doesn't run in a, in, a, in a proper program, so to say, right? So what happens if Python crashes, right? If you do some weird stuff and you can't return back, you know, one thing that you can do is you can tell Python to stop, like to interrupt or to restart or to shut down even. But, you know, if things are really bad, Something that you could just do is crash the server by hitting control C and then the server shuts down and you are done with Python. Right now you see connection field and this program doesn't run anymore, right? So that's a little bit about the mechanics of, um, of Jupyter Notebook. Another way to start up Jupyter Notebook is by opening your terminal or your command prompt and for Mac users, they would just type Jupyter space notebook and start up the software, right? And we're here again. For Windows users, um, I recommend you to go to your, um, to your menu, uh, to your start menu. Let me just real quick go to my Windows computer. And I have to freeze the screen a bit while I'm entering my password and stuff. So right now I'm on a Windows computer um, at Tilburg and the way I start up Jupyter here is that I don't open the command prompt. I'm just searching for CMD because I'm an impatient person. I do a lot of stuff with keywords. So if I press Windows and you just search for CMD, the regular command prompt opens. But there is a new command prompt after you installed Anaconda. So when you search for anaconda you'll get the anaconda prompt and you can open it up it looks a little different it says base at the beginning and that kind of refers back to that perfect environment that i talked to you about right that perfect city where there are no holes in the street and all traffic lights are just working um, that is your city and you can imagine a different city uh, with different weather conditions to test your program. And you can change these environments. In programming you know, con concepts, that would mean it's, it's you know, maybe a programming environment with other versions. And you can use this other environment to test your web scraper um, with older versions of packages or with newer versions of packages. So you know you can work in different environments, and that makes you like very very uh, productive. But we don't need to touch so much upon it. What I'm saying is, Windows users, if you want to open or work with the command line, the best thing to do is open Anaconda prompt and then work from there. In the same way, if you type Jupyter Notebook here in Anaconda prompt you can uh, access it. And uh, right now, actually, uh, I got some issues starting it up. So I don't know what's going on here, but you know, I don't want to solve it right now. Um, hope, hopefully that works for you. Otherwise, you know, we can, uh, we can uh, explore. 
All righty. Um, let me um, continue with um, my notes. And what I wanted to do now is I wanted to go through the data cam tutorial. Whoops, sorry, I'm too fast. What I'm doing is I click on the data cam course introduction to Python. And I'll walk you through a couple of steps of what I think is important. I just posted the link to that tutorial um, in the chat. So if you want to tag along, open it. And I'll lock out real quick to show you how you can get locked in for those users who haven't done so. So click on it. And uh, the way Tilburg users get locked in is if you use Google to authenticate yourself with it. Any question? I think somebody unmuted, Quinton. No. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. I thought right. you unmuted yourself. And what well, that's fine. So what you do is you sign up with, you sign in with your Tilburg University EDU email address. And then you're kind of, you're kind of in it. If you still experience problems, there is a um, little post how to unlock the content of data camp, because I think our librarians, they need to kind of get you onboarded too. So i just posted that link in the chat, right? Right now, we're looking at the course content of Data Camp. Um, it's a great way to get familiar with um, Python. It explains you why Python is there and you know why you should learn it, um, but it's not very specific to web scraping. So this is kind of the thing that I want to do with you here, right? Um, and a first topic, well, sorry, before I do that, let me spend just a little bit of time acquainting you with the interface of Jupyter Notebook. So when you start up Jupyter Notebook, you open a quasi Windows Explorer, or I don't know, you know like, a, like a tool to explore your file system. Um, when you start up uh, Jupyter Notebook with the uh, Anaconda Navigator, you essentially see all of the, um, all of your uh, file system. So all of your drives typically and, and all of your folders. When you start it up, that's very important. When you start it up yourself from the command prompt, all you see is the directories that belong to the directory that you're in. So right now, if I'm opening it up, right now I'm in my dprep directory where I have developed this course. If I'm starting up Jupyter Notebook here, let me close, oops, sorry, close the existing sessions. And by the way, I can also lock in just by copy pasting the code here. All I see is the content of my course, like content, and then I got modules and week one and all of the source code for this first week that I have written. But you can go to any other project, like that's where the world of Jupyter Notebook ends, right? So. When you open it from the command prompt, what you want to do is you want to go to a directory from which you can access the directory where you want to work in, right? So for me, that's research projects. All of what I do is in research projects. So if I'm starting it up here, I get a list of all of the research directories that you know I'm working on. Of course, DPREP and ODCM is here, but all other kind of research projects or ideas or anything that I've worked out, right? So when you open it up, Make sure you open it up in a directory where you can work. Um, that's important. So um, a little bit about the interface of Jupyter Notebook here. Um, so you work in a file system and you want to create files, right? And what you can do is you can just like, for example, open a new folder and call this, um, is that untitled folder? And you can click on it. It's a little clumsy. You can rename it, and I call this DPREP session two. So it just moved up here, and let me open it. And now I can like write code in here. And let me open a new Python notebook. Well, if you're using um, Anaconda more extensively, you can also have R notebooks in here, uh, for example, and even other programming languages like Julia, um, if you ever heard about it. So it's a flexible way to do stuff. So you can also write text files uh, or access your terminal, your command prompt. But right now I'm opening a Python 3 notebook. For many years I've used Python 2 because it is, I think, in a way still supported, but um, many people are now migrating to Python 3 because that's kind of 
where we need to go and that's the future so what you get is you get you know nice, nice looking interface where you can write code it says code up here sorry i'm zooming in a little bit because i feel it may be necessary for you guys so let me zoom in so you can all see uh and tag along here right so you have cells that you can write for instance code and you can use python like a calculator just type one and one one plus one click run and you can also have markdown cells, which is um, some explanation about what you're seeing. So I can write instructions to you and you can write explanations to me about the stuff that you've done. That allows you to mix and mingle code with explanations, right? That's essentially how it runs. Um, it um, runs from top to down. So when you click on run cells, it runs from top to down. We can also make use of variables in Python. That is the first concept that um, I think the data camp course um, is, um, is, um, is, is working with. And let me insert a, a new cell above and use markdown, use one hash to make a title. And I call those variables, you know, makes it more structured if you later on want to look at this thing. Variables are super important, right? Because, um, for example, in web scraping, you want to have a variable called URL. And uh, give me some, I mean, I can look at my doc. What do you want it to scrape? Let me just, um, I'm just interested in transfer marks right now. Um, so here we go, accept cookies. And probably you're interested in market play. What are you interested in? It's just like, let's say most valuable clubs. Yeah, there we go. All right. So for example, you want to get data on the market value of Manchester City. So let's just click on it and see this page. There's a whole bunch of information that um, we can get. The market value, is the market value still here? Market value, I think it's just the player market value. I, I, I've never been on the site, so sorry. I need to... Um, look at this um, in more detail. Well, let's do like this. Let's suppose we want to get and capture this page. And um, you can have a variable called URL and you can write down the name of that, that page. I'll just paste it that URL. And you may remember from our introduction lecture that we can import packages and we can actually call this URL to get the content of this website. Remember? So if I now look at the source code and I just randomly pick, um, let's say uh, 200 characters from the string, oh, response content from text, I think that's it. Oh, actually I didn't get the URL. So that's uh, content, let me see what's happening. Content responsible for, oh, okay. Actually, I think uh, transfer marked uh, is trying to block access uh, for web servers. Let's try something else. Um, let's try amazon.com for now. And I'm just opening a random product, whatever people need this for. Um, so I'm going back and I'm swapping the URL. I just like have another line and I give another URL. And maybe also something is wrong in my code. That could also be the case. 503, okay, so I think Amazon is trying to block me, but at least I get some, uh, some source code back, right? So the purpose of variables in scraping is, is that you can write one program, which you see below, to collect data from the web, but it works with different values of a variable. You know, once it tries to get data from transfer mark and it fails, we're going to solve that eventually, not today. And the other URL is, um, you know, the web shop um, of Amazon. So variables are super important because we can run the same program on different stuff, different websites, different books, different entities on a website, different products at Amazon, different clubs at transfer mark and so forth and so on. Okay. So we get string types, which, which are characters. You can wrap them either in single quotation marks or in double quotation marks, okay? 
if you want to use a double quotation mark in your string, you should wrap it in single quotation marks. For example, this is funny. Okay, let me just do it. Text is this funny, print text. It's going to print as this is funny. See, I'm using double quotation marks, so it interprets it as a character because I've wrapped it in single quotation marks. You can also do it the other way around. This is, um, uh, I live in, I live in Seto Bos. This is, I think, the best example. So let's do this. So I can get this accent, right? But the moment you try this, I live in Seto Bos. you already see it by the markup. You've just like screwed it up because it doesn't understand what is an accent and what is the beginning and end of a string. All right. Comments in Python are entered with hashes. So way before Jupyter Notebook was invented, programmers wanted to communicate to each other what they're doing and they're writing comments. You start them with a hash. And then when you rerun this cell, um, you don't get an error because this is ignored. It, it just interprets it as text for somebody to read. All right. There's something I want to tell you about um, the flow of this document. Um, and um, Python interprets this document. Well, it runs cells when you tell Python or Jupyter Notebook to run cells. So here I'm setting the URL and here I scrape. Suppose you're entering this notebook um, as a newbie. Right, you just open this notebook after I send it to you uh, on or uh, post it uh, to the website. You can simulate this by uh, restarting your kernel, so it kind of crashes Python in the background and opens it up again. So it doesn't remember what you've done, and it says, "Do you want to restart? All variables will be lost." Yes, restart, and you see, you know, something happening in our server, and now we've restarted, but now it doesn't remember all the cells that you've run. So suppose right now you wanna to go to the scraping cell. It says like, I can't find the URL, man. And that is because you haven't run the URL cell yet, okay? So that's one of the most common mistakes is when people start out with Python is that uh, with Jupyter Notebook is that it only runs what is uh, executed unless you go to cell and you click run all, and then everything will be run. And Python does it top to down. It's that stupid, right? It first does this cell, then this cell, and so forth and so on. So um, think about this when you encounter errors. Always remember, have you run the cells that precede the cell that you want to run? If not, run all cells. Maybe that is one solution. For my work, sometimes that doesn't work because some cells take like an hour to run, like for complicated stuff, right? So that's a complication. And that screws some of your work up. And that's the biggest criticism people have against Jupyter. So it's not so logical that it only runs what you click on. At least that's what programmers think, okay? So we, what we've talked so far is like variables. You can have variables because they're important because maybe they hold the name of a URL, but that is a string variable. But what we also got is we got um, um, uh, we got um, uh, numeric variables that hold a number. So for example, we can say, um, well, um, let me make an example. Um, page is one. And um, if I want to, um, you know, increment this with one, I can do page equals page plus one. And I can have a cell that prints the page number two. It stays two, right? And when I run this cell again and rerun this cell, it's gonna be three. And so these are numeric variables and what you can do with numbers is well, calculating, right? And that's super useful because um, uh, in web scraping, what we sometimes need to do is we need to, um, let me go to transfer marked as well. We need to 
go through multiple pages. This is page one. This is page two. This is page three. This is page four and so forth, four and so on, right? So as a way to tell Python to do this, we use numeric variables. Um, you can calculate with strings. So let's take my city plus one, which doesn't make sense, right? You can't calculate with characters. If you wrap a number in quotation marks, it thinks it is a string, but it's not, right? So you can't calculate with strings. You can only calculate with numbers. But sometimes it's useful to, um, to, to uh, convert between variable types. So suppose there is a variable that you want to capture and it says, it says page one. And when you want to figure out what's the next page, how can we extract this one out of there and calculate with it? We can, use the replace function, which is something you'll learn in this thing. And we say, we replace page space by nothing. And this becomes a one, right? We have, we take this and we replace page space by nothing and we get a one. Can we now calculate with it? For example, do plus one? No, we can't because it can't calculate with strings it's still a string see it's wrapped in quotation marks so what we want to do now is we want to convert it into a, a number and we use this with the int function integer so it takes whatever is in this brackets and makes it a proper number see quotation marks go and now we can calculate this is a lot of stuff in many steps but i'm wrapping it up right so we have um string with a number we want to capture but can't calculate with um, um a string so let me do this again so captured content uh, replaced plus one doesn't work solution remove page space and convert to number. So we say numeric content, we can use a new variable, which we call numeric content is this. And now with numeric content, we can now calculate. So for example, numeric content plus one. Are there any questions up to this moment? I'm probably going to uh, spend um, on a scale from one to 10. Who wants a break now versus in 10 minutes? Eventually, we're going to need a break, but I need to gosh how far you are right now. Who wants a break? Put it in the chat. If I get more than people who write break, we go on break now. Otherwise, in 10 minutes, let's make it that easy. 10 votes for a break. Oh. Doesn't look like you want to break. So that's cool. Um, Python, I actually used the chat, right? If you had actually put it in there, I would have you know, used a okay, in 10 minutes. Um, so um, let's talk about lists. How do you think about lists? Mm. Like a list is a, a collection of, of items of, of lookalikes. For example, a list of like, you know, websites or a list of courses that you can take. We use lists in scraping because whoever was interested in transfer mark is probably not only interested in Manchester City, but is interested in all of those clubs. And we may want to get data on all of those clubs. Um, but, you know, 
we don't want to like individually write code for all of you know these clubs. We want to have a list of URLs and then a little program that works through this list of URLs, right? So for each item in this list, first open it for Man City, then open it for uh, Paris, then open it for Manchester United, then open it for Chelsea, so forth and so on. So we're defining lists. Um, so um, I'm copying the link just for now. Um, and I call this URLs because it's a, it's a list of multiple things. You can also just call it, you know, whatever. You can literally call it whatever, but that is not so clear because people who will read your code will not be able to understand why you called this wherever, right? So let's call this URLs. We're going to wrap it in uh, quotation marks and I'm pasting the first one separated by comma. And I go through this website again, Paris. And I'll post it in there and let me do a third one, which is Manchester United. Just loaded it and I can also print it. It actually converts these quotation marks to like single quotation marks, which is totally fine. Doesn't do you know much. Uh, you know um, we can we can use that. And right now we could write a little um, you know um, well oh we're not there actually yet. We can refer to items of this list. And what you need to know is that zero is always the first item of a list. So this is the first item. This is the second item. And this is the third item. Suppose you're running. If you're running this, it says, well, I can't find it because I just have like three items and you're trying to get the fourth item. Um, you can also um, extend that list. So suppose you want to add some stuff to this list. You can do. Your else, I hope this works. No, um, that is calculating with strings, which obviously doesn't make sense. Let me see whether this works. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to add more stuff to the list, you could just like add a list. So let's say we want to have Chelsea on this, which is the fourth uh, uh, club. You know, we can just add this URL like this. And now it's a list urls2 equals urls plus this. So urls is of length three and urls2 is of length four. And I haven't run it properly. So let me do it again, click, click. Yeah, it doesn't print this. So this is length of urls and this is length of urls2, which is the one where we appended stuff where we added stuff the length of urls you may wonder how the hell do i know all of these commands that's practice 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 the best way that you can learn these commands is go to um uh, the course page and do we have cheat sheets on this course page i hope i look and we don't okay so the best way i need to examples maybe no about no okay so the best way that you can learn this is to google for python cheat sheet and yeah i mean this doesn't look so nice but you know it got you covered uh, pretty much um this is a more fancy looking one, how to create a string, math operators, how to store strings and variables. These are all the topics that I'm touching upon right now, right? So I'm just posting this to the chat real quick. So, you know, this is also another one um, that's probably very good. You know, just have them next to your computer, put them under your pillow and, you know, find the one that works for you. You forget commands like all the time, right? so don't feel bad about it. You'll forget how things are done, but you know, practice makes you makes you makes you excel in this. So right now we have uh, you know uh, uh, created a list and we added stuff to a list, um, and um, we can also. Well, that's I think that's I'm gonna gonna do uh, later. Uh, let me see. 
Um, importing packages is, is something we've done already, right? When I imported requests, the requests package. So when somebody does this, it could happen, it doesn't run. Who gets an error when you do this? If you do it, so for, or, you know, you can do import requests. Also try import pandas, whether it runs for you guys. Any error, who gets an error? Um, nobody gets an error, that's amazing. Uh, okay, so let's import um, um, another package set. Um, let me see. Yeah, I can't think of a package that I don't have. But what I wanted to say is if you run into an error in importing packages, chances you haven't installed the package yet. So how that works is, actually the best way this works is to um, open Anaconda prompt. And let me see whether I can do this. Um, far, um, let me exit Anaconda real quick new terminal. So now I can type like terminal code without actually opening an account of prompt. And um, you can now use the pip command to install packages. So for example, if you don't have requests, what you will type is pip install requests. And it gives you this message. Hey, I already got it, dude. I don't need to reinstall. Okay, so if you encounter, if you're working at this university on a computer, you can't install packages like this, but you will have to tell the computer that you want to install packages only for your user account because you can't do it like for the entire computer. Pip install dash u for user requests. And then it would install this package only for your user account, but it's been installed. So I'm switching back. By the way, how do you save in like Anaconda? It's auto saving. Whew. But you can give it a better name, which is uh, walkthrough uh, live stream two. All right. Um, I'm almost done with this part um, of the session. Uh, the only thing that remains before the break is writing functions. So you remember we have URLs, right? Which is a list. Um, and I would like to write a web scraper for each one of those things. So what we can do is we can um, write a function which we later on call for each item of that list. And in Python, for example, a function could just be to print the URL, right? Remember that? We had that at the beginning and URL is still defined at Amazon. So we can create a function. We call this, for instance, scrape. Well, let me start even easy, easier. I'll just write a little program that when I call it, writes hello world to the stream. Ultimately, I want to work towards a function that can scrape stuff. But you know, when you want to scrape, you want to tell the function what to scrape. So you can have parameters to that function. For example, I give it the parameter URL. You know, I can, when I rerun this, Scrape says, hey, I can't run because I'm missing an argument. Right now we're telling, well, all the time you have to give a URL. So let me just give, you know, my website, for example. If you run it now, it still runs, but it doesn't do anything with this URL, right? It just prints hello world. But we could as well write like, hello, I am scraping plus URL. And now every time this function like is called with uh, Tilburg University to the EDU, it takes this new argument and does stuff with it. Why is this so amazing? You can write a little, little program that does a job like extracting data from a website, calling an API, doing whatever, calculating some stuff. And you can use and reuse that program for different things, which is gonna make your code look nice and small. And you can reuse the code because you know this function, you could just post on the web and everybody that you know wants to run this function can run this function, okay? So that was the last thing that I wanted to show you right now. We're gonna go on a break. It's gonna be 10 minutes and I'll see you back at 57, all right? 
And I'm sticking around for questions with regard to installation. Um, and I'll need a few minutes to get a copy. And I'll do that first, all right? So I'll be back in like three minutes with um, a Q and A on installation issues. So um, I'm monitoring the chat. So please, uh, you know, put stuff there if you like. Um, we will now like in a bit cover um, the, the other Python tutorial. I'll walk you through it real quick. But what I will do now is I will save this thing and I will show you where I save it, right? I did this um, on my, um, um, on my um, local computer. And now I want to put it to the cloud and like a really cool way in Colab is actually you can import these notebooks that you've done locally. So for example, upload notebook, and I will go to um, um, wherever I have done this. And I think it's in research, it's in deep prep session, walk through, open. And now I can also share this notebook with you guys. So, and it looks ugly, but you know, Maybe you guys can clean it up, okay? But um, I will share it with you. So, and I don't want to put it on the website. Yeah, I can put that link, but it's like a living document. It's like nothing that should stay for eternity. Restricted, and actually I can make you all editors of this document too. So, you know, the stuff is yours. So I will put it in the chat right now. This is my notes, and I'll actually continue with more notes right now. Um, oh, Umber, I just answered your question, I guess. Um, um, uh, good. So let's continue. So I'm closing up lots of stuff that I've done. I will continue in the cloud now, I guess. Um, and I want to catch you again from, you know, where we left off. We are working through the Python bootcamp the tutorial that was assigned for this week. And what we've done is we covered quite some ground, right? So um, I walked you through the most important steps of the data camp course, and I showed you why it's important that you need to learn this. Um, I spent some time familiarizing yourself with Jupyter Notebook, right? Like how to start it up and what are the most common issues that you get? And hey, how do I find the file that I you know, wrote in this thing? Which was just the issue um, that a student in this class experienced. Um, and um, we also have a little tutorial um, that was specifically developed for this class. Um, and these are the last grounds that we need to cover, a few concepts um, that you're still unfamiliar with. You can either save this on your disk and open it in Jupyter Notebook, but Jesus, I become to really love Colab. It's the first year that I'm using this for teaching, but it's so much uh, faster, easier. Um, you can just open it in Colab, okay? And I will not walk through this um, tutorial um, uh, by you know, clicking on the code cells because this is like walking through a PowerPoint with like only text on the slides, which is like stupid to do. But what I'll do is I'll again take my notes um, and I'll zoom in on why the topics that are covered matter. Please open the collab um, the notebook and collab at the same time, either my version or or that that original tutorial version, because um, you know when I go through these chapters, try to recall on whether you still remember this stuff, and you know you make you can ask questions uh, throughout. So um, I will uh, continue with my walk through, and I will uh, make a new title here, um, a new um, text cell, uh, which is. Um, tutorial um yeah it's weird that all of these things are called tutorials so we kind of don't know what the difference is but okay i'll work on those naming things okay so the first topic that um is covered is called conditional logic okay so what does that mean um you know when programming programmers make use of rules all right so i want to describe this so my 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 oldest daughter she's six um and like a year ago she um got this um lego robot um lego wunder what it was wunderkind lego robot this one uh it's actually pretty cool so if you have like nephews or something and you want to give this uh, nieces and nephews it's, it's damn nice so um 
what you do with this robot is you can you have like building blocks and um, you can like, uh, I don't know, build different things with it, right? This is like a robot with wheels and it can go, um, um, uh, but you can also build like, I don't know, an alarm clock. You can like mix and mingle these blocks in different ways, right? And um, she uses a, um, a programming language on the tablet, um, which is called Scratch. It's a visual programming language, um, which maybe I should put easy behind it because this looks um so in essence um let me see you are defining this is a youtube video i don't want to look at youtube videos um rules in programming even when kids start out to program you start by defining how do i maximize this anybody can i maximize this share add report just want to look at this screenshot just want to show you that Open picture and new tabs. Thank you. I look so stupid. Choo. There you go. Right. You define rules, and even my my daughter knows this. Right. For example, one rule is like move ten steps, turn fifteen degrees, turn this. Right. Only oh, these are actually actions. But you can also say like if you know this robot hits a wall, turn by one hundred eighty degrees. If it detects light, make a sound like a barking dog, right? These are like rules that trigger certain things, certain actions. So you've got rules and actions. And in web scraping, we need rules to do stuff, right? For example, if we have 100 products that we want to capture on a site, it should stop after 100 products. In programming, for instance, we could have a loop. And I know looping comes a little later, but I can I explain it without a loop? Let me make it very easy. So maybe the, you're still remember we got these URLs up here. So let me, oh, actually I need to run this entire thing. Run, run all. Let me make it much easier. Hopefully this works. Yeah, we get some stuff and, let me see whether this works, URLs. Yeah, we got the URL, so that's good. So URLs zero is Manchester City. And we can have a rule and say, is this Manchester City? We can say Manchester in URLs, and it will give a true if it is in there and a false if it is not in there. So for example, if you wanna write a scraper that only scrapes stuff where there is Manchester in the URL, you can have like a little rule like this, right? If Manchester in URLs, print, it is in there. Is it in the second one? No, it's not. It doesn't print anything. We can say if Manchester in URLs, the second URL, print it is there, else print, it is not there, stupid. Let's see how that works. And the last one, it is in, it is in there. Manchester was in the last one. Actually, I don't remember. Let me check what's going on. Let's view URLs again. Oh yeah, Manchester United, Manchester City. Yeah, exactly, right? So, we need these conditional workflows for many things, right? For example, you have a list of URLs, some of which are from Amazon and some of which are from eBay, and you only want to scrape Amazon, right? Then you need to tell the program, well, I'll only take Amazon URLs. The cheap way to do the same thing is open Excel and filter for URLs only with Amazon, right? But then it turns out, or for eBay, whatever you're interested in, but then it turns out at eBay, you have some pages that are product pages where you can check prices, but others are like the... I don't know, the about page of eBay, which obviously you don't want to scrape, right? So you want to filter again. And especially when data sets get massive, think about lists of URLs of a million products. You don't want to do this in Excel, right? You want to cleanly do this in Python. The other good thing of doing this in code is that other people are able to see how you filter things. Um, so if you're taking DPrep, my other course too, you know, 
you look at this, you may remember the chaos in my file system, which I created, like, because I didn't adhere to much structure. So actually I have like hundreds of versions of the same data set because I used to do, you know, some of those things manually in Excel and nobody understands what I did because, you know, you can just compare Excel sheets maybe, but there are no rules written how I did this. So that's also why it is important that we do stuff in code. Okay, so um, this is conditional logic and we can, we can trigger one program or the other. Um, you remember, so this is, uh, let me do that text and we call this uh, conditional logic. Um, there we go. So right now I'm making another cell, which is um, what I want to do, dictionaries versus lists. So you remember lists. The URLs is a list of stuff. So super easy to use, but sometimes we want to store extra data about a particular, you know, unit of this end of these entities about a particular entity. And I'm really not into soccer. So um, um, let's suppose we want to store on whether they are playing in the Champions League or not, all right? So one way in which we can pass attributes here is to use dictionaries, okay? And dictionaries look a little different. So what we can do is we can add code and I'm constructing this right now. You can use, um, for example, the URL is, and you need to tell me on whether they play or maybe the first thing that I can store safely without revealing that I don't know anything about football is that I could attach a country attribute, for example. Uh, country is um, England. And um, um, Champions League, is, are they playing Champions League or not? You need to put that in the chat. Yes, okay. So we said that's too true. This is another variable type. It's boolean and booleans can take on the value false or true nothing more right so let's run this um it all worked and if i add a code cell uh, oh and let me save this to a variable right now and i say uh, club one is this and now i can access you know, I can look at this club one and click on play. I get this, but I can access these attributes too. What is the club one country? Oh, it's England, right? And then later you could say, uh, you know, you could define rules. I only want to, you know, scrape data on English clubs. I only want to scrape uh, data on clubs which are in the Champions League, right? So right now we have enriched this with attributes and we can put together multiple uh, you know, dictionaries in a list. And then instead of looping through a list of URLs, we loop through a list of dictionaries, okay? So let's define club number one. Let's define club number two, which is Paris. So, and, um, you know, my prior is there playing in the Champions League too, because otherwise they wouldn't be such a top club. You know, sometimes you can make some smart inferences with not, without knowing anything what you're talking about. So welcome to my job. Um, so, and we'll take Manchester United, which probably also play uh, Champions League and there again, uh, England, right? And now we can put them together in a list. List of dicks is club one, club two, club three. So let me rerun this again. Uh, I have run this and I can look at this list of digs. And I already advanced to the next topic. Now I can actually loop through this list very conveniently. Loops are important because you don't have, you know, 24 seven time to do your web scraping. You want your computer to do the job, right? So what we can do is for club in list of dicks, print club, 
country. So for each item of this list, show me the country. So it's going to be England, France, England. What we could also do is we could, um, you know, swap this and say URL. We'll do both. And it doesn't matter. Suppose it, it, instead of this print, it was a function that accesses this website and does some magic scraping. Well, here you go, right? You have your little scrape for each club in the list of digs. By the way, the naming doesn't matter. You could call this item. Well, if you run it now, it doesn't work because you call each item item, but then inside the loop, you refer to it as a club. So it doesn't know. You can do item item, it still works. You can, you can do any name that you want. The only thing that matters is that for each iteration, so each time this program walks through your dictionary, it, you know, you can access this item of the dictionary with whatever variable you define up here. So, and the best thing in scraping is to make it actual what it is. So for club and clubs, I would say, and let's not call this list of digs, let's call this clubs, because this is what it is makes your program way more accessible to others that will eventually work with us. And you can combine it with conditional logic. If, for example, thinking about scraping plus club URL, I'm concatenating strings, I'm like joining them together. If England in club country, print scraping, else print will skip. And then the scraping function obviously goes here. You see that I'm using indents? Indents is like these little spaces, or actually I add them with taps, right? It is a hierarchy through your program. So for each club and clubs, work through this. If England and club do the thing that's indented to the next level, otherwise do this. In that way, we ensure that the program knows the hierarchy of what should go on. It shouldn't print scraping if you know England is not in there. And it shouldn't say we'll skip if England is there. So that is extremely important, actually, maybe not so covered so well in what you've seen so far, right? Thinking about scraping this one, scraping, thinking about scraping this one. Well, it's from France, so we don't want it right now. We'll skip. Thinking about scraping this one, scraping, right? I mean, we're just printing stuff to the screen, which may be boring to some, but you know, that's a little how, how, how that works. So we've just combined lists of dictionaries. Dictionary is amazing because we have attributes that we can name rather than just stuff. Um, so we've learned how to loop through a list of dictionaries and combined with conditional flow, conditional logic. Um, And in this tutorial, there are like a hundred ways to loop um, through uh, different stuff. So, you know, take your time. Looping is the, your bread and butter of web scraping. Okay. Um, yes. And uh, Trung, uh, if you don't use indents properly, you'll return an error. I'll demonstrate it right away. Suppose I remove all the indents. Uh, it you know, actually after a four, you know, after initiating a loop, it always expects an indent because, you know, it's not the main program, it's that looping program, right? So you want to fix that. And if you don't do this, if this is not properly indented, because after an if, you also need to have a sub program, right? It says like, I don't know. So when you get things like this, it's probably the indent, okay? One issue with working with indents is also that if you open this program on different computers like Mac versus Windows or browser versus local, uh, you know, when you're adding a tab, 
sometimes the uh, client that you're using enters two spaces and sometimes it enters three spaces, sometimes it enters a proper tab and then stuff gets also screwed up. So right now this works, but suppose I was gonna add just one more space, things are gonna be, you know, bad again. And this is what's gonna make you freak out. Um, you know, uh, at the very beginning, because, um, you know, you don't see it, you don't spot it, you don't have the feeling for this now, but this is what goes on. And like this, there are like 10 other things that will happen. So please be in touch uh, about this so you don't get stuck and too frustrated with this. It's just something that we need, right? We have world and one world gets executed in one way and the other world gets executed when another condition is true. Okay. Um, there's three more chapter, oh, chapters, sounds too big, but um, uh, stuff that I want to zoom on, zoom in. One is um, a comment about functions again. So it's not so well connected to what we did before, but uh, functions uh, 2.0. So I call it 2.0 because we've worked on functions uh, earlier. Um, so let's call a function. I'll call this scrape and I'll have a URL. And I'm going to print um, the, um, the URL. But we've done this. And if I call scrape with a, uh, for example, URL now, URLs zero, um, I get this. Um, so it's a function functions can or cannot have arguments, right? So def scrape, no argument in here, right? So when you call scrape one, let me move this up. Uh, if I call scrape one, scrape one works without, a, uh, without uh, an argument. So I run this, I get high. I can have parameters, uh, sorry, with arguments, with arguments. And it can also have with return values. So for example, we take this URL and then we scrape print URL and it should return, for example, whether the scrape was successful. So it returns a true. This is scrape two, uh, scrape three. So if scrape one, no arguments, just do some stuff. Scrape two is do something with the arguments, e.g. do something with this URL. And the last version is scrape three, which is do something and tell me something about what you did. So for example, the version of scrape three is used to tell, hey, I was successful in scraping or something like, hey, I wasn't successful or it returns the data from the website. You know, this is the basic stuff about what you can do with functions. No return arguments, just run stuff. So for example, I use this function to start up my browser. You know, I don't need any return value, just like start up my browser, that's it. You know, with arguments, I used to work through a list of URLs to do the scraping. And um, scrape three, I use really for status messages, right? Uh, is, you know, uh, I give a URL and I get back on whether the product has any reviews or on whether the user has recently watched anything on Netflix. And only if this user is active on Netflix, I will continue with my scrape. Uh, what you'll learn later on is that you know, sometimes in scraping, you automatically generate lists of stuff that you want to get, like football clubs. Is maybe you don't have so many football clubs, right? But if you think about products at Amazon, you need to like maybe filter more about what you want to get. And you could do this with the third version of this. So that's that. Um, what do you do when you encounter errors? Um, I think I've gone through many things here. Um, and, and the most important stuff is, is really um, get your indentation right, 
uh, get um, an indentation, you know, the, the, you know, the things when you work with functions or, or conditional statements. Um, but it could also be um, about installing packages that could go wrong. My prime resource really um, to get some, uh, get some uh, insights is really to just Google. So suppose I do scrape one with an argument, I get an error. Type error, trace back. And then what some people do is they will take this and paste it to Google as a search. Okay, but this will not lead you anywhere because uh, it just says you, it encountered an error. Actually, other people will put this into Google to get the answer, but nobody has ever written about scrape one because I just invented that function. You'll not find anything there, but this is the error that probably you wanna go and Google for. So you need to be a little smarter than just copy pasting. Type error, scrape one. Type error get takes one. When Python tells you generate code takes zero, blah, 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 it's telling you that your method is set up to take no arguments, but the self argument is still being passed with a method call. All right, still sounds a little complicated, but think you guess, you, you get it, right? So that's the way you Google for stuff. Another market of uh, good resources is um, Stack Overflow. So by the way, you already see it up here. Uh, it's one of the uh, resources that pops up first. So it's a, it's a very good um, uh, board where programmers exchange ideas. And um, typically what you'll do is at the beginning, you'll read everything, but you find it like to be not so applicable. When you get more experienced, you trust Stack Overflow and you scroll through the solutions and solutions get upvoted. So this has like 38 stuff. Right, and uh, usually the ones with most upvotes really is the best solution. So that's what I'm using too. There are two other chapters in uh, the notebook that I can't cover today in this lecture. One is um, about using try and accept. That's actually, uh, if we know your program will have an error and you wanna skip that error so you don't get this ugly crash mess message. For example, you're trying to extract the age from a user of, um, from, yeah, from, from, from a social media profile, but there is no age available on the website. Then it will tell you like, oh, I can't find it, error, boom, and the whole program crashes. Well, you know, it's natural that not all users report their age. So you can tell the program to skip that. That's the try and accept that you need to take a look at. And finally, it's about reading and writing data to the disk. Maybe I'd just do this for uh, fun, right? If I want to write data to the disk, I can open a new file.txt, and I don't know how that works in the cloud. I open it for writing, and now I can write some text to it. It's actually very simple. I close with a new line character. I can also have some taps in there, which you do like this, and then we'll close it. And I don't have a clue where it saves it. Probably somewhere on my Google Drive. So let me go back to uh, Colab. And I called this file new file.txt and the new file is not there. So I don't know where, um, where they put it. Oh, by the way, they have a link to search Stack Overflow. Amazing. So you can immediately search for errors from within. Okay, I don't know where Google saved this. If you find it out, um, you know, let me know. Um, it saves it usually in the directory where this uh, stuff is, um, where, this, where this stuff is run. So maybe I need to refresh search results, maybe. Do this again. Yeah, I don't know. New text. Pull up notebooks maybe again. Yeah, it's not so important. You'll find it eventually. Good, that's that. Um, that's all I wanted to cover for today. And, and it's, it's almost 10.30. So let me take another round of questions uh, and give you a little preview about what's to come. So um, obviously, if you haven't worked through this, do that. You don't learn it by just looking at me doing it. You really have to learn it. And uh, number two is form communities, meet each other. If you don't have friends yet, that's not, you know, that's not uncommon because you've just started the program, make friends. Um, there is a, a WhatsApp link where you can informally connect uh, to all students and you can just like ask who's interested in making a study group. 
you know, get together and work through this together and set up a Zoom session where you meet up or meet on campus. Or uh, I see somebody, Lorenz, are you in the library? Looks like the library, but uh, that's an amazing place to meet up too. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, maybe not. <laughs> um, all right. So um, work through this together, right? I have expected you to have worked on this already. So, you know, take a little time this weekend um, or, you know, today, tomorrow to work through this. What's there to come? Well, we're about to start uh, in week two next week, right? And you will um, get familiar with um, the workflow of scraping, right? There's so much you need to know. And the paper, Fields of Gold, is the one that leads the way. Um, it looks shockingly boring, for, uh, like formative, uh, because we submit it to an academic journal and they will reformat it anyway. So we don't waste any time formatting these things. So sorry, it looks ugly, but the content is great, I hope. Uh, you like it. Um, um, so read that paper um, uh, and yeah, reason through it and uh, read it again. Um, you will have to read it like every week, I think, again, because there are so many details in there you don't see in the very first instance. And then work on the web data retrieval for dummies tutorial, which actually makes you able to collect some data on the web, at least shows you how it works and gives you the intuition. And you need to prepare breakout activity one, which is the ideation, the, the idea generation. We started this a little bit today, but there's a whole bunch of stuff um, you need to do. Check out the preparation uh, before the breakout activity. Really make this amazing. Uh, so also read our discussion section in this paper, like really try to be creative here. Let's not, maybe not scrape Twitter. You know, that's cool. But unless you have a really amazing idea, I've seen this like so many times, you know, make it, make it matter this time either an amazing topic or like an amazing new data source. And if you want to do Twitter, that's also fine, huh? by the way. But, you know, make it matter. 